right, tonight I want to talk about the weapons of our warfare. The weapons of our warfare. I'm going to begin with three quick points. Number one, we're in a war. Number two, the war is spiritual war. Number three, spiritual war requires spiritual weapons. We're in a war. As we near the end of the War of the Worldviews Project, which has been all year, I want to remind you of where we began. If you weren't here, I stood before you on the first Saturday of this year, and I declared we're in a war. The message was entitled, Welcome to the War Zone. My text was Matthew 10, 34, where Jesus said, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, whenever Jesus told them, think not, it was because that's exactly what they were thinking. Uh, And today that's true. There are many, many people believe that, you know, Jesus is for peace at all costs. You know, we're supposed to just be nice, nicer than Jesus. And that anything that ruffles anybody's feathers or uh, creates any kind of potential division, you know, he's peace for peace and, and we're for peace and love and joy and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And of course, there is a truth in all that. But I think we've missed something, and that's why we've done the project. The Christian life is not a cakewalk. It's not a taffy pull. We're in a war. <laughs> You might say we're born again onto a battlefield. Number two, the war is spiritual war. When Jesus said he came to send a sword to the earth, he wasn't talking about a physical sword. He wasn't speaking about I'm going to send a saber into the earth. He was speaking of his word, which is the sword of the spirit. He preached the gospel of the kingdom a biblical worldview which he knew would provoke a battle with every other worldview. Jesus was not naive. He knew that his message, properly preached faithfully, was going to ruffle feathers. So we're in a war, it's spiritual. And finally, spiritual warfare requires spiritual weapons. Now we're going to look at two passages tonight from the Apostle Paul, one from Ephesians, the other from 2 Corinthians. Uh, we'll start in Ephesians 6, where Paul is describing the nature of the warfare we're in. He says in chapter 6, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The NLT version says we wrestle not against flesh and blood enemies. Our enemies are not people. It, It sure is tempting to think so. I see people on TV sometimes just want to go, whoa, that, but it's, that's not our enemy. Our enemies are not other people, flesh and blood. You say, well, you don't know some of the people I know and I'm involved with, even in my family, I've got some, well, you're not dealing with the flesh and blood enemy. There's something behind that. And we need to know that. Remember years ago, someone said that, that Paul uses the matter for wrestling. The warfare you and I fight is up close and personal. You know, in wrestling, you, there is actual contact. It's not like tennis, you know, where you stand on one end and the guy stands on the other, and you hit the ball back and forth, or baseball, we're all spread out all over the field. It, it, wrestling is a contact up close. It, it, it's as close, a face-to-face encounter. And that's the metaphor that he uses. You and I are wrestling, not against flesh and blood. Now, I'm not really a big fan of the living Bible, but it's real good on this one. Verse 12 says, in the Living Bible, for we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies. 
That's powerful. We're, we're battling persons that do not have bodies. The late great Bible teacher, Derek Prince, one of my heroes, once said it was the revelation from that verse of Scripture that delivered him from a lifelong battle with depression. Even after he was a Christian, he battled serious depression. Some of you may battle depression. He said when he saw that, he, he got a hold of Isaiah 61, verse 3, where it says, God would console those who mourn in Zion. He would give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. When you are dealing with depression, now, I'm going to say some things tonight that I've known a long time and have just been a part of me. But some of you, this may be, I mean, you will walk out of here tonight probably with something that, that is going to help you the rest of your life. And this is one of them. We are dealing with persons without bodies, spirits, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Try this at home. When you suddenly feel depressed, and I think we all have those moments, you know, suddenly we just feel, have you ever had that? I mean, even if you're not a person who fights with depression, I've had that, uh, you know, I'll just be, I'll, I'll just come down and Lizzie will say, well, are you okay? Say, I don't know, I just got depressed. A spirit has walked in the room. You are feeling the presence of a person without a body called a spirit of heaviness. Now, if you see that, because we tend to think if we're going to get, you know, we get depressed, you know, well, it's something wrong with us. We've got to get ourselves straight. Not you, that you, <laughs> there is an entity. And in the same way, you know, you can experience some people walk in the room and everybody gets a lift. You know, you know, we all know people like that. They just come in the room and everybody just gets a lift because the vibe. Well, this is the way it works in the spirit world. Okay, that good? So the garment of praise is uh, praise and worship are two of the weapons we're not going to cover tonight, but praise and worship are a weapon. Let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. So the Apostle Paul is saying we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Then he goes on to say what we are wrestling against. Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now Paul is giving us by revelation the hierarchy of the warfare that we are waged, waging against the enemy. And I believe these are in descending order. I believe it starts with the highest principalities from the word principal, meaning chief or head. Powers, number two, three rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, there's four levels there, and we're warring. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So get ready for the battle. Get ready for the battle. I believe the warfare we fight on, most of us are fighting the lowest level, which is spiritual wickedness in high places. And I just pardon me, but I have, this is me. I think the high places are right here. I think most of the warfare, I don't think any of us, frankly, are 
most of us are not qualified to fight principalities by ourselves. Principalities are the big devils, high-ranking, powerful. Uh, Now, this is just, and I'm not the only one that believes this, but I'm just saying if you don't agree with this, it's okay. But I just, I believe this has worked for me for years. I've just realized I'm dealing with spiritual wickedness in high places, and the high places for me are in my mind. That's where the enemy attacks. Okay, so what do you do? Therefore, when he says therefore, always find out what it's therefore. So he says we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting these entities, persons without bodies. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So he says, if you're going to war, you better have the uniform. You need to suit up. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. This is pretty good. This is, this is, this is pretty good. Can you imagine a football player running out on the field tomorrow at an NFL stadium in his underwear? I mean, seriously, I thought about that. You know, when these guys go out to play tomorrow, they are going to suit up. They're not going out there in gym shorts and track shoes. They're going out there with shoulder pads, hip pads, knee pads. They're going out there with protection. They got a helmet. And I had a picture as I meditated on the message this week of how many Christians go out on the battlefield in their underwear. They're not armed. They have no armor on. They don't even know what it is. So he says, what is it? Let's, let's, let's look at this. I'm going to read this all. It's not going to be on a slide, but here it goes. Put on the whole armor of God and stand having girded your waist with truth. Now I'm, (laughs) boy, I'm tempted. I could just do a whole thing on having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all kinds of prayer, and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, that's a mouthful. We cannot go through, I'm not going to, it's not the purpose of this message to go through the prayer armor, but I could. But I just want you to know this is a big subject. Now, I have a book. This has been in my library for 30 years. This is the Christian in complete armor. It's by a Puritan. His name was William Grinnell, still in print after after all these years. He preached and wrote in the 17th century. This book is 600 pages, and it's not big print. You can see, look, it's not big print. You know what it is? It's all right. It's a commentary on 11 verses. The whole book is on the prayer armor of Ephesians uh, 6, verses 10 to 20. He takes every piece of armor and he just expounds on it. And I, I guarantee you, I, I go to a lot of Christians, do you know anything about the armor of God? The what? In Ephesians 6. Oh, yeah, I've heard of the sword of the spirit. I've heard of the shield of faith. Beloved, take on the whole armor of God. That's why it's called the Christian in complete armor. If anybody would like to borrow this, if you've just got a lot of time, 
But see, the Puritans were serious Christians. They're not like today. And I don't know, I'm not picking on anybody, but you go down and get the best-selling books at the Christian bookstores, and, and, and they're, they're by authors everybody knows, and they write a book every six months and make a fortune. They're so lightweight, honestly, and I'm not trying to be critical, but there's very, very little stuff that challenges you. It's mostly pretty frothy, pretty lightweight, designed to make you feel better, but you're not, you don't grow. What doesn't challenge you won't change you. So people sometimes say, well, you just, well, you know, Pastor Raz, that's just too much. I can't, I can't chew all that. Well, you know what? I'd rather give you that and let you try to chew it and grow than I would just give you something, you know, prune juice or something. <clears throat> okay, I got to move along here. So the foundations, we're in a war. The war is spiritual, and spiritual warfare requires spiritual weapons. It begins with putting on the armor. Now we're going to switch over to 2 Corinthians 10 and pick up three more things. How we fight, what we fight, and our weapons for the fight. Okay, First, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, that's kind of what he was already saying. How many of you see it? It's not, it's not flesh and blood. And here he says, we walk in the flesh. That means we live in the flesh. We experience things in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly or physical, but mighty through God. Our weapons are mighty through God. They're not mighty through Smith and Wesson. Or Remington. We can't win the world war the worldviews fighting against flesh. And this is why the church, I believe, has not been very successful at times taking the political arena. We're we're against certain people and they're, you know, but we don't, we haven't gone to the level where we understand that it's the spirit that's, 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 that's controlling them and their worldview. Okay. So how we fight, we fight with spiritual weapons, mighty through God. What do we fight? And here's another one. This is a real nugget. This is a keeper, okay? Just like those, just like I said, the levels of, of warfare, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Four. Okay, here's three. Three things. This is the war. This is this is what we fight. These weapons are mighty through God, too. Number one, the pulling down of strongholds the casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Three, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is the warfare we fight. Now, as in the satanic kingdom where you've got principalities, powers, okay, now you are fighting against these three things with your spiritual weapons And these are in order. The strongest, the strongest is strongholds. Pulling down what? Say it. Strongholds. Casting down imaginations, bringing every thought into obedience of Christ. Let me state this negatively. Follow this. This this will change your life. Every thought not brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ becomes an imagination, forming an inner image of picture of something evil. Imaginations not cast down become strongholds. Now, when you get to the level of a stronghold, you are now at a level of a whole system of thinking. 
It's way beyond a thought. Notice it just, it all starts with a thought not brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That will become imaginations. And imaginations that were not cast down will become strongholds in your life. Now, stronghold in the dictionary is a place that has been fortified to protect it against attack. Now, we sang a beautiful word tonight, and next year, beginning in, I think in January, we'll do some spiritual warfare stuff on the blood and how to use the blood, because a lot of people know the blood's my defender, and we praise God for the blood, but they don't know how to apply it. But we'll, we'll do that. Can't do it all tonight, but a stronghold is the enemy's fortified, defended position to protect it from attack. When a person has failed to bring their thoughts captive or cast down evil imaginations birthed by those thoughts, the enemy will establish a stronghold so strong that you might need help to get free. Francis Frangipan said this years ago in one of his first books. He said, a, a stronghold is a house of thoughts. That is very powerful. See, a stronghold is not just one thought. That can be brought into obedience to Christ, but imaginations get stronger. And when it becomes a stronghold, it's a whole house of thoughts. This is why when you're dealing with some people and you're trying to help them, it's okay to attack one bad thought they have or one error they have, but you have to realize you're dealing with someone who is, has got a house of thoughts. You're not going to go out and win one of these socialist, liberal, professional politicians by winning one argument. They are coming at you with a whole system of thinking. It's a stronghold. And don't laugh at it. It's very, and it can happen to uh, uh, believers. I got to be careful here because when I start talking about uh, spirits and demons and people, you know, they say, well, you know, Christians can't have a demon. No, I do not believe Christians can be demon possessed, but I know we can be harassed and attacked by demonic forces. I know it. I don't even, it's not, it's not even something I want to argue with you about. There's some things I don't even want to argue about anymore. People say, well, you one of those that believes there's a demon behind every bush? No. There are two or three. Okay, that's, that was a little bit of a joke. A, a stronghold is a house of thoughts. Let me give you a couple of examples. I really want to nail this for you. All the church surveys of the last 20 years show that the number one struggle among Christian men is pornography. Now, you can not like that or you can disagree with that, but I'm just, I'm telling you the truth. You can go check it out. But the surveys of what men struggle with in churches, Christian men, is pornography. Now, a man opens a website whether by accident or on purpose, and he sees something that gives him an evil thought. And watch this. An evil thought. If he does not cast that down, that will evolve into imaginations. And if you do not cast down the imaginations, a stronghold will be produced that you will be compelled to act upon. See, thinking is not acting. It's a long way from seeing a woman and having a lustful thought to actually doing something shameful. But this is how you get there. You get there with a thought, one thought into an imagination and then into a stronghold. And strongholds, you compel to act. So where, where would you begin to defeat the problem of pornography? With the thought. 
You say, well, man, I've got a friend and, you know, he loves God, but he's, he lost his family. I'm, and I've had friends lose their, wife, lose their family over the pornography. Stronghold. I mean, guys that know better. Men that know the word. I'm one I'm thinking of, I did the wedding many years ago. And then I, what a shock. I mean, well, I lost touch with the couple. And then I found out years later, you know, she caught him looking at pornography. Time and again, caught him, caught him, caught him. Didn't stop, didn't stop. Well, you know what? Now they're divorced. Very serious. I mean, when the thought comes, the first thought, you about on your game, you say, well, that, that thought, I better, I got to bring that into captivity because if I left that stay, well, I can handle it. You can't handle it. That's the, perp that's the point I'm making. You cannot handle it. If you get on the devil's ground and let a thought that you won't bring captive to Christ, you let it stay there, this is the way God says it works. All right. Let's go with uh, divorce. Problem of divorce. I mean, you know, it's a big problem. It's the biggest problem in the church as it is in the world. And if you've been divorced, there's no condemnation for you in Christ. I'm just saying, I, I <laughs> some of my best friends are divorced. <laughs> that was a joke. I've got to keep trying to give you a little humor here, you know. So, No, I'm, I'm serious. There's some great Christian people, spirit-filled people, people who love God with all their heart, and they're divorced. I mean, for whatever. Um, but I want to focus on the adultery aspect, which is a lot of times that's involved. Well, where does that happen? I believe that all extramarital affairs begin with a thought that becomes an evil imagination that develops into a stronghold that compels the sinful behavior that can destroy marriages, families, and even churches. The biggest pure revival in a local church we were ever involved in was in 1972-73 in Little Rock. Power broke out. We saw blind eyes open. People get out of wheelchairs. It was the whole package. There was so much excitement. We had church every night except Saturday night. We had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, every night except Saturday night. And, and people were trying people would fill up the house every night. You talk about revival? I've, I've, been, I've seen it. What happened? Church exploded, went from a couple of hundred to probably close to a thousand. That was a, it didn't even see the thousand. It was just packed out. We were on, went on TV. Well, the pastor got caught committing adultery with a choir member. <laughs> what happened? I don't know what went on privately, but I know one thing. This man had a thought about that woman that he didn't bring captive. And then he began to imagine what it would be like to be with her. And then he en ended up in a point where he had to act on that. Folks, you don't just wake up in bed one morning with someone not your wife and say, oh, what happened? How did I get here? How did I commit adultery? How, why was I unfaithful to my wife? Oh, man, I just slipped up. No, you didn't. You thought about this for how many? Who knows? You imagine. This is why flirtations on, in the job place. You know, you said some nice-looking, attractive woman, you know, gives you a little compliment. Of course, men just, <laughs> you know, Compliment me. She likes me. My wife doesn't like me anymore, but she, she likes me. And then you start noticing her and imagining, well, let's go have lunch. Let's go have lunch. And then you have lunch, and hey, we've got this in common, that in common. And beloved, I'm just talking reality here. I'm just, this is just the way it works. I don't know why we're so religious, pompous. You know, as if, well, oh, God forbid. He does forbid. But you do it anyway. Why? 
because you don't have your armor on and you don't know anything about spiritual warfare and you don't know how this works. It's supernatural. It's not, it's not natural. It's supernatural. That, there's power in it. <clears throat> okay, and I could multiply examples on that process, but now you know. Thoughts, imaginations, strongholds. That's how it works. I'm going to move to a close, and I'm running late. I'm just take give me uh, hmm, three or four minutes here. How do you? Well, how do you win? How do you? Well, you. you uh, there's a lot to this. We're going to do a series on this. We're, I'm going to do some things uh, when when we're through with the worldviews. But uh, let me just talk about the sword of the spirit, and I'm going to pick that one out. I could have talked about the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith the shoes of the peace, the gospel of peace. I mean, but I'm going to take the sword of the spirit. And the reason I'm taking that is because it is the only offensive weapon in your arsenal. You see, the helmet is defensive. That protects your head. The breastplate is defensive. That protects your heart. The shield of faith, that's a, def that's, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith by which you will quench all the fiery darts of the devil, but that's still defensive. The only offensive weapon you have, he says, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take up the sword of the spirit. What's the sword of the spirit? Which is the word of God. You know, if, if, if there's any model for warfare, it's Jesus. Before he even launched his ministry, as soon as he was, as soon as the Holy Spirit came down, before he even healed anybody, preached any, you know, before he did any miracles, the Bible says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. And the devil came to him after 40 days of fasting when he was at his weakest point, and he brings him three temptations. And Jesus defeats him in all three ways by what? Quoting scripture. In every case, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he passed the whole test. And as soon as he had passed the test of using the sword of the spirit, he was launched into his three-year ministry, which prepared him to go to the cross and die on our behalf. He used the word of God, and he's a model for us. The word of God, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There is no solution for you and me in the warfare if we don't know God's word. And I'm not speaking about a kind of casual knowledge that many people have today, the average churchgoer spends no time in the word, then wonders why the devil defeats him all the time. The late Leonard Ravenhill said, how can you pull down strongholds of Satan if you don't even have the strength to turn off your TV? My personal experience is that the devotional reading of the word of God is the only hope that I have to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The great 19th century English preacher J.C. Philpott said, quote, it is not merely taking a text and quoting passages that will beat back the fiery assaults of Satan, but it's having the word of truth brought into your heart by the power of God. The biblical illiteracy in the church of Jesus Christ in America today is disgraceful. We send our Christian soldiers off to the battlefield with no swords. We send our children off to secular colleges with no spiritual armor. But God has given you and I the right to bear arms. We have the right to bear arms. That's a big deal in America. Your Second Amendment, oh, I want my right to have my guns. Well, you've got a right to carry spiritual weapons. But some of you haven't even, you know, taken lessons in how to shoot. The war of the worldviews is there for the winning if we're wearing the weapons of our warfare. I like that. 
The war of the worldviews is there for the winning if we're wearing the weapons of our warfare. There are many more things I would say, but you cannot bear them tonight. <laughs> so I'll give you a break. David knew a lot. I'll close with this scripture. David knew a lot about warfare. And I love Psalm 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my arms for battle and prepares my fingers for war. He is my love, my fortress. He is my savior and shield, my place of refuge. May God grant us the faith to put on the whole armor of God and to use the weapons of our warfare, especially taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name.